So, um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the third Culture Days webinar of the 2020 season. I am Megan Fro Metcalf, the Outreach and Programs Manager at Ontario Culture Days, and I am going to be your host and moderator today. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land I'm speaking to you from is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron Indigenous Peoples the territories covered by the Upper, Upper Canada Treaties. We're especially grateful that everyone's joining us today, particularly during this very busy and unusual summer. Wherever you're tapping in, we hope that you enjoy today's presentation and leave with new tools and ideas for hosting digital events. Today's structure is simple. It's the 40 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute Q&A period. Only the presenter's microphones will be on. So please type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll be reading it out as many as we can. The session will be recorded and available later if you wish to review it or share it with any of your colleagues, and we definitely hope you do. Today's webinar will be focusing on tips, tricks, and hacks for making the move to digital programming. The current pandemic has forced many of us to make the move to digital, whether we like it or not. If you normally plan in-person events, thinking about how to translate those experiences onto the screen can seem intimidating. I know with my own programming, I'm spending a lot of time trying to figure out what it is I don't know. I'm sure a lot of you feel the same. Thankfully, we're already six months into this pandemic and there are people who have already figured it out for us. So I am going to introduce our two speakers, Neil and Nadine, um, and I invite them to turn on their cameras um, and we're just gonna get started um, introducing them in a second. So Neil Adams is a semi-retired punk musician and IT consultant with a focus on digital communications in the arts sector. He's from Regina, Saskatchewan. Neil has been on the Cathedral Village Arts Festival Planning Committee since 2016. And he also sits on the board of a new Saskatchewan alternative music and arts festival, Swamp Fest. Nadine Villison Feldman is the director of programming for Myzeum Toronto and has been engaging diverse communities through cultural programming and meaningful participation in the arts for over 15 years. The former artistic director of Carlos Bolson Theatre and co-founder of the youth-led Capistinan Philippine Centre for Arts and Culture, she developed multi-arts events and cultural festivals that have nurtured a vibrant community of Filipino-Canadian artists and built a, a, sorry, a platform for Filipino culture and arts in Toronto. Nadine has worked with a variety of community-centered arts organizations, such as Vibe Arts, Vija Dance, Drum Arts, and the Real Asian Film Festival. And she's curated programs, animated public spaces, and produced mid to large scale community performance projects. So thank you very much. Welcome to our speakers. <laughs> so to kick off this conversation today, I'm going to ask our two speakers to talk a little bit about their programming and what changes they made to accommodate for the lockdown this spring. So I know that you both had to make a big pivot to give, uh, or each to get into lockdown and adjust some of your programming. Um, can you start off by giving us a really top level overview of what that program was going to be pre-COVID and what it ended up looking like? I'll um, ask Nadine first. Sure. Um, so just to begin with Myzeum, we're a museum um, that aims to tell the diverse narratives, um, past, present and future of Toronto. Um, and uh, a major program that we had coming up um, leading into April was our Intersections Festival, which is a month long annual festival uh, that we produce in partnership with multiple um, individuals, artists, collectives, arts organizations, cultural institutions, um, and uh, it involves many different types of programming, including exhibits. It can really look like anything, walking tours, um, uh, the, uh, theatrical experiences, um, uh, talks. It, it can just look like many different things. And in this particular year, we had 30 plus uh, exhibits and events planned for the month of April. So that, that was, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then obviously, can you give us just a little bit of information about how you started thinking about things as you realized you were going to have to go digital? Uh, I mean, I think like many people who are, you know, who plan and, and um, run events, uh, I, I think it was literally changing as new information was coming in. It was literally our, 
uh, our strategy was literally changing from day to day. Yep. <laughs> kind of, you know, maybe two weeks leading up to the festival, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, cancel canceling the launch event, um, which is how we open the festival and, you know, uh, and, and uh, can bring in audiences or up to, you know, three to 400 people. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought, obviously, we can't convene that many people. Uh, that was kind of moment one. And then very quickly that moved into, okay, maybe we need to consider um, postponing events that were happening in the first week may, and see how we can maybe move those into the second week and just kind of wait and see how things progress. Um, that, of course, evolved into, okay, maybe we need to cancel. Um, any uh, events that involve, you know, gatherings of, of groups, of, large groups of people, you know, 50 to 100 people, and just focus on the exhibits. And ultimately, you know, um, the decision that was ultimately made, of course, uh, right before this, right before shutdown was that we would postpone the festival. Um, so, so yeah, it was a pretty, dizzying <laughs> yeah I remember seeing you <laughs> it, was, it was a very busy time well I think March feels like a million years ago but everything was coming so fast and, and of course you know we this is not something that we run our on our own this is as I mentioned in partnership with many different people um, and organizations so there was also you know that to contend with to, to be back and forth with the partners um, um, and, and letting them know moment to moment how we were um, thinking about moving forward. Um, yeah, that's a good run into my next question. Can you talk a little bit about that planning process and what that looked like? Uh, you mean leading into COVID? Uh, yeah, le leading into the digital programming and, and sort of and how you, you okay. made that move with your partners and everything like that. Yeah, so it was, it was, it, it happened very quickly, um, and, and the decision to postpone, uh, you know, there was all that communication then with the partners day to day about where we were at. Um, finally, when we decided to postpone the festival entirely, indefinitely, um, we very quickly, that, maybe that happened on a Friday, and then, then on the Monday, we were thinking about, um, there, there was certainly an appetite to, um, uh, to have a digital presence uh, mm -hmm. in that moment. Um, you know, we were, we were, we were poised for it. Um, but, uh, it, 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 yeah, we had to, we had to think very quickly about what that would look like and what that would mean. And so what we did was, uh, as I said, we were in constant conversation with our partners. Um, and obviously this is a global pandemic that's happening. So, so we weren't really interested in telling people that they had to do something, mm -hmm. um, but we sat down with the different partners and it was really partner to partner what the discussion was, um, which is generally the way that we work anyway. Um, and we just said, you know, um, we just asked our partners, do you feel like there is space here to, to, to provide a digital program? Does it make sense? What might that look like? Um, so there certainly wasn't, um, we didn't have any expectations in terms of what that content would look like. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't come in thinking that it would look exactly, you know, we weren't looking to replicate what was going to happen in the festival. We just wanted to provide the platform and say, um, you know, do you, we just put it to our partners and said, do you want to respond to this moment? And if so, what does that look like? So the kinds of programming that happened in that moment looked different from partner to partner. One partner, for example, um, on a project called Im Images of Resistance, uh, which was about uh, the Tamil protests that culminated in what is known as kind of the Gardner protests um, in Toronto. Um, they were going to have a community event that brought together different community members to talk about their experiences during that time. And there was going to be um, uh, an exhibit, a photography exhibit to accompany that. So, and performances. Um, so they got together uh, pretty quickly amongst themselves to, to think about what that might look like. There were many partners involved, uh, many community members involved in that project um, and came up with something that was, uh, that looked a little bit like a variety style show. So there was talking, there were talks, there were, there was um, uh, performances, there was art. Um, 
so it was quite similar to it was a digital version of what might have that community event might have looked like. Yeah. Um, but we also had a project called Chinatown, um, which was about how do you preserve uh, um, the heritage of, uh, you know, a community like Chinatown structurally? How do you, how does that get captured? Um, and, uh, and that pivoted pretty quickly into um, a digital program that actually looked more like uh, a speculative fiction writing workshop that was about uh, Chinatown in, in 50 years from now, I think it was. Um, and so that became a, a writing workshop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the second part of that program was that people were able to kind of share that process and, 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 that, and some of those stories. So it really, yeah, we were just really looking to respond to what the partners felt uh, was important uh, to them at that moment. Yeah, and, and what did like the execution look like in terms of like the partners had an idea, you were responding to them, were you hosting them on your platforms or how did that like, how did the actual like logistics come out? So in the meantime, we also had our own programming. Um, <laughs> Doing a lot. <laughs> it was just kind of like, okay, we need to do digital programming. And, and so in a lot of ways, you know, we worked in a way that is not how I would want to work as a programmer, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, being thoughtful and having a lot of runway and uh, engaging partners in that programming. We didn't end up being able to do that as we got further on, but the first couple of programs happened very quickly and were initiated by us, um, which is not necessarily how we always work. Um, and so we had developed, uh, you know, we were able to respond pretty quickly with our own programming. And so we had already started to develop some best practices around mm -hmm. it. Um, and so when we decided that, um, so when partners started coming back to us from the Intersections Festival saying that they were interested and this is what it might look like and this is what, uh, we just felt like we were already kind of developing some ways of working and that we would just, um, that we would essentially host uh, in the sense that we were the production team uh, and, and the platform for that. Yes, absolutely, to answer your question. Um, but initially, it's, it's actually not the way Intersections works. The idea is that Intersections is, um, ideally, uh, we're going into our partner's space. Okay. Um, and and uh, that we're going into community, we're going into spaces, um, but, but it just made more sense, we had been doing this, that it made, that, that we were the host. Um, yeah. So provided the technical support. Um, and, and some of the best practices that we had started to develop. That's good. I'm excited to hear about those best practices once we get to the, the conversation bit. Um, I'll actually move over to, to Neil now. Um, we'd love to hear about the Cathedral Village Arts Festival. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it has looked like in years past, not 2020, and then um, just sort of very briefly about what you started to have to think about once you realized that it wasn't gonna look like a normal year? Well, thank you um, for having me, Megan, and um, Alyssa and Shannon from Culture Days there as well. Um, so the Cathedral Village Arts Festival is a, a six-day multidisciplinary festival. It opens with a parade, closes with a street fair that uh, founded in 1991. It was just a street dance the first year and has since grown to this epic thing that takes over the whole neighborhood for a week. And uh, it's five different venues scattered throughout the neighborhood hosting various events and, like I said, multidisciplinary. So we have uh, literary events, theater, music, dance, and one more that I can't recall right now. But it's a, it's a volunteer-run festival. So we have one, one singular employee in an office in a city community center. And... Um, 100 and at least 150 volunteers. It's a 12 member committee. We're funded by grants, a couple of fundraisers and some corporate sponsorship and that's it. Like we don't have much else in the way of funding. So we had to make do with what we had. And um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, not, sorry, continue. <laughs> okay, so the um, yeah, and that's, a, that's our normal year. Is it's, a, it's a big operation that takes a lot of bodies to coordinate. And then, you know, mid-March comes around and things start closing and things are shutting down and nobody knows what's happening. So 
we were hearing things like, oh, it'll be six to 12 weeks until we can open up safely and do things again. And that was 18 to 24 weeks ago now. So we weren't, we didn't know whether our venues were going to cancel our events for us or if the city was going to deny our permits. So we had to decide for ourselves and take it, take that power back and say, okay, well, we have 10 weeks until our planned start date. Let's just do the entire thing, copy the format all, all across onto digital platforms. As best so you're trying to get ahead of it. You, yeah, you didn't want to wait. Yeah. We didn't want to, we didn't want to wait and find out that we weren't going to be able to do what we wanted to do. So we did what we wanted. <laughs> And so once you made that decision, what, what did you have to do to get that ball rolling, make the move to digital? Well, we started online meetings very, very quickly and very regularly just to try and, because it's, it's performance. It's all like the, the arts festival is pretty much all performance based. So finding a way to digitize and, you know, get those, get those out there online was the number of performances we normally have is in the range of 30 separate pieces. Mm -hmm. So arranging that, the theory was that we would just put it all in one schedule and you can tune in to our channels at the time you want to see the thing and the thing will be there for you to see. So that meant live was the theory. So we were live. And I, I, I'll say live-ish because everything was pre-recorded, stitched together, and then broadcast as one big chunk. So you could just tune into the Cathedral Village Arts Festival channel, so to speak, and just watch it, whatever was on. And, and then did you have like a staff person sort of behind the scenes if people had questions as the live events, live-ish events were happening? Yes, that was, that was me. <laughs> I was I was mission control. I was mission control for the whole thing. I did all the editing because the way our funding works is the majority of our grants were earmarked for paying artists. Like I can it was Canada Council for the Arts, I'm sure a lot of our participants are on the same sort of schema for grant funding, local art boards. So it was earmarked for paying artists. So we couldn't afford production facility and we couldn't afford video editing and videographers and, and communications to to do this stuff for us so we had to do a DIY yeah um, I think it's everyone has really sort of had to figure things out on the fly and and sort of figure things out yourself which is why I think conversations like this are really useful because you've done a little bit of the the heavy lifting for us thankfully <laughs> yeah we um, were the first by 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 a, a bit like we were the the arts festival is may 18th to 23rd every year it starts on victoria day so our window was very short for making the transition mm -hmm. and just sort of getting into some of the broader panel questions um but this is a good sort of segue um what what technology did you really rely on for the festival? Um, like either like a program or platforms, like what really like helped you out, <laughs> got you out of a bind? Well, um, our, the bulk of our audience is on Facebook. So I was sort of shoehorned into using Facebook as our, as our primary platform mm -hmm. for this because it, it, they make it easy, but they also make it very difficult. So um, I used a piece of software called OBS, which um, I'm sure uh, Alyssa has a link for somewhere. The OBS is um, open broadcasting software. It's uh, an open source free, basically a television studio in a box that gives you all of these tools to um, edit video. You can do picture in picture, you can do voiceovers, you can connect it to a Facebook account and then just press start streaming and it will stream to your Facebook account, stream to your Facebook page. But for the, the non-Facebook user, which there are more than there are not these days, is um, you want to embed that stream somewhere. So we embedded it on our website, so you can just go to our website and watch it at your convenience 
rather than having to watch it through Facebook. So you could just go to our site anytime and there would be something playing for, we did four hours a night. I had 22 hours of uh, streaming content that week. Holy smokes. That's a lot. And you got a new website out of this, correct? Was that because you needed to be able to stream the software? It was a number of things. We had a Google site up until this year. We were um, like a lot of arts, well, like a lot of small arts, arts organizations, our website was terrible. It was no good for anything. And we'd been fighting and fighting. Like we have a governance board. Uh, it's our community, our local community associations actually our governance board. So we were fighting and fighting for the funding to get a website for years and years. And this was the time where it's like, if we don't have this website, we cannot do any of this. So we managed, our, our web designer was un amazing. He did the whole thing in three weeks which is an incredible turnaround for a site like that, and including a store for our street fair vendors because we have our street fair is 400 artisans, 400 local artisans. We take over 10 city blocks mm. on, the la on the Saturday of the festival. And when that got canceled, that's $40,000 in revenue for the festival that went, went away. So, but we had su such lower overhead that it, it was neither here nor there, but we, we built a store on our website for our vendors to use to try and sell their wares. And we made sure that there was no fees and there was no commission or anything from us. You'll see, you'll see a few of those locally where it's, you know, local craft vendor websites will have, they'll have fees and commissions on top of it. So, but we wanted to make sure that the artists were the ones getting the bulk of the money. Yeah, that's really been a silver lining of all of this is that there's new, um, I've heard of a lot of organizations that are getting new websites or are finally getting on social media or things like that because they have to because of, mm -hmm. of COVID. So it's been, it's been sort of one of the benefits, I suppose. Nadine, can you speak at all to uh, what platforms you were using or uh, any websites or, or software you really recommend? Yeah, I mean, I was just in regards to like being on social media and having a website, like we were really fortunate. Um, our, our marketing director, Josh Dyer, had really, um, has really been responsible for establishing us online. So we already had a very strong digital presence um, and are able to kind of like talk about our, our events um, through social media um, and share widely. Um, we relied and rely still very heavily on Zoom um, and, 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 you know, all kinds of things were coming out uh, about Zoom and privacy and, and all of these things. Um, and we just, um, we just didn't have the time. We were doing so much programming. Like we were probably doing at least, um, you know, two pro two digital programs, two to three digital programs a week at one point. Um, uh, and it, we kind of went on like that until I'd say probably June. It's only now that we've just been a little bit more relaxed or maybe we're just used to it now. Um, but we went at quite a very fast pace. Um, and so we just didn't have the time. We were already learning lessons on Zoom as we were going and kind of developing protocols and um, ways of coping with some of the limitations of Zoom. Um, and so we had just kind of become as effective as we can be as a team on Zoom. And so we are looking, we have been recently, now that we've slowed down a little bit, we've been looking at other um, other platforms, but because, you know, um, yeah, just because we become so comfortable producing on Zoom, we're, yeah, we're still there. Do you, I know that you, as you said, did have a, a pretty big online presence already, um, even if you weren't doing online programming. Um, do you feel like that familiarity was beneficial um, or did you realize you had to start thinking of things very differently once COVID hit? I mean, um, I, I think that our organization is, on the, is, is already built on a model of responsiveness. Um, and so in that sense, and responsiveness um, both to our partners, but also to our, uh, where we're programming. So for example, we our programming space is across the city. We don't have a we don't have a venue. The idea is that the city is the museum, and uh, that we are going into different spaces. So we're always in a different space. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so we're always having to respond to a different location, a different space. And so um, in that way, I think our, our team having to respond to a digital space operated in very similar ways. You know, what's the container? What is, you know, what, what does the, um, yeah, what is the container for the program and how does that determine? I'm really big on venue and the venue being the right venue for the program. Um, and so, yeah, it was really just thinking about, okay, if this is our venue, what does that mean in terms of the content uh, that comes in and how it's presented? Um, yeah, I think all of, uh, for both of you, because you are such small arts organizations, I think that nimbleness really benefits you, especially in times like this. Um, so thinking about the move to digital, there's always a steep learning curve. <laughs> did, you, did either of you have any like bloopers or near misses, um, you know, things that you want to share that we could learn from or realize that hey, everyone makes mistakes, but you can keep rolling with the punches? Nadine, okay. you go first. Oh, sure. I mean, so many. <laughs> <laughs> well, give us one. Give us your favorite. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I, oh gosh. I, I mean, I certainly think, uh, uh, like, I'm a little bit of a protect perfectionist. I like transitions to be smooth. I like to look organized. And so, you know, just little things like transitions between, uh, you're, there's always, even now, our, our team is like really like a well-oiled machine around this digital thing, but even the way that we program, every program looks a little bit different. So there's always like little, and then of course there's like certain technical things that you just cannot help. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of them is things like sharing media, for example. Um, and even now, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that we're perfect, but as far as I'm concerned, as long as we've planned for it and we have a contingency plan in place, then you know things that will go wrong obviously always do and then we have something else in place to try to cope with whatever te technical dif difficulties might arrive arise but so for example sharing media um you know something's always going to go wrong with sharing media and sound and so we have we have another person on the production team who's ready to come in and jump in with their shared media if something goes wrong. It just a lot of contingency plans is is how we've responded to the things that go wrong with digital programming. Um, so things like if sound, you know, if there's somebody who's a storyteller, um, or if we have media that is sharing a story. So it's media of, for example, uh, we had um, the farm worker share their story. Um, but they weren't with us in the live program, so they had to pre-record it. So our contingency plan for that, if the media wasn't sharing, if the sound wasn't working, would be that um, one of the panelists uh, would um, have the written text of that, of that story and that they would share it. So, so we have a lot of contingency plans. We're always thinking about what could possibly go wrong. I'll share a little tip around media because we have like, we have a welcoming slide. We have, you know, if there's gonna, if people are gonna share photos or if we're gonna share photos, we take care of all shared media. So we don't leave that up to the participants. We do all of that and one person is responsible for that. And we usually do a PowerPoint um, and have all those slides on the same PowerPoint so that when you're, um, so that you're just pulling up from one place and that you're not looking for different screens or different places to get your media, to get your opening slide, to get your whatever it is that you're sharing. So we put that all on one PowerPoint slide. Um, that's just a very technical but helpful tip, I think, um, in terms of, especially if you're doing a, pro a program that has a lot of different elements uh, throughout. Yeah, that's a very good tip. Um, I think that certainly it feels like with digital programming, you almost have to be more prepared just because technology is, can be unreliable, but thankfully it does also seem like people, especially in the past six months have been very forgiving if anyone has any little technical bloopers, which is nice. Uh, Neil, can you, uh, do you have any other experiences you want to share? Oh, I have some bloopers already. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, give us your favorite. <laughs> we are, we were live. We were live live. Well, not live live, we were live-ish live. But what happens when you're live on something like Facebook is the um, record companies have these little bots, little robots that patrol the internet looking for copyrighted material. 
And one of our dance performances, we had a salsa dance group uh, used La Gasolina. And um, we were taken down. Our live stream was killed immediately. And this was the no. Friday night. This was Friday night. It was the first act on Friday night. So of course our, it was. <laughs> yeah, our live stream was immediately killed for La Gasolina. So um, Facebook overreacts to um, music copyright and they, cause they'll kill you. They'll just kill you straight. Like something like YouTube, they'll demonetize you. So you can't make money off of that copyrighted material, but Facebook is not as forgiving. So that's something you can learn from is be very, very careful about licensed music because they killed us dead. We weren't all, not allowed to live stream anymore. So I had to, I had six more performances that night. So I had to individually upload each one of them and premiere them and race against the clock to get them up in time to do it. Fortunately, I have very, very fast internet, which is, which is something you should all have. If you're considering any, any sort of digital programming, like it's a pain point, you know, you want to find these little pain points and eliminate them. So if you have slow internet or you have your computer acts a little wonky sometimes, like you want to, find those problems and eliminate the things that take control of the things you can control, I guess. Absolutely. You can never have too many test runs. You'll always find that like your picture's sticky or the sound isn't working quite right or something like that. Yeah. It's, a, <laughs> it's important to like try and work through these things and figuring out what all the worst case scenarios are and what you do when that happens. Um, if someone's tackling digital programming for the first time, is there one piece of advice that you could give to them? Someone was approaching you and said, Neil, what should I do? What's your number one tip? Yeah, it's things like, like I said, um, find your pain points and eliminate them. Those little digital pains that you deal with every day and you just live with will be a problem if you're doing online programming in a, you know, if, you, if you're running a museum in Karen Port, Saskatchewan, and you want to get you want to do some programming, make sure your internet is, is, is reliable. And things like um, uh, verification is a big one too. Like your Facebook page can be verified if you give them certain business registry information. And that'll allow you to, prom to put money into promoting things that you wouldn't be able to do beforehand. Like you can promote, I didn't know this, but you can't boost uh, a scheduled live stream without being verified. So I wasn't allowed, I wasn't able to do any of that because we weren't verified because I didn't know it was a thing. And then things like um, YouTube, you have to, uh, you're, if you want to go live on YouTube, you have to exist for 30 days before you can live stream over YouTube. So if you're planning on doing your culture days programming over YouTube live, start your account right now and get that rolling. Yeah, it sounds like whatever platform you're planning on using, you have to read all of the fine print beforehand to really get an idea before you do your programs, what you need to be aware of. Yeah, like I had planned on using Facebook and YouTube simultaneously, like I was going to broadcast on both just for accessibility sake for people that don't have Facebook. But Facebook's terms of service tell you you can't do that. You have to be exclusive to their platform. Mm. So little things like fine print, it's, it's important, to, important to read. Absolutely. Nadine, do you have any, uh, any tips that you would give? I mean, I think, you know, as you said earlier, I think you can, it's like any good planning. You can't contingency plan well enough for this, and you have to consider everything, including, obviously, internet connection and, and all these, these things. I would say specifically for Zoom, um, a very simple... <laughs> But important thing to know if you're programming for the first time is that um, give yourself some time at the beginning, especially, well, I would say start simple. Don't start with the digital programming that has lots of different elements. You may want to start very simply like a talk such as this, which is very simple format. Um, and if not, then you, you definitely want to do lots of runs. Um, and you want to practice. And a big thing is if you have multiple people coming on, different speakers, um, you're definitely going to want to give enough room um, 
for to to make sure that everybody is online and the sound is good and you know that you can see them and all these things um for your first event make plenty of time to welcome people in uh and um and make sure that you have any possible email address that they need to that they need to uh enter the zoom link with because if you know they're gonna we've discovered this at the beginning was that if you had one uh, like a work email for them but they decided to enter the zoom link um and their zoom was connected to their personal email then they weren't getting in Mm, okay. And you don't want to be learning that lesson when you're about to start. <laughs> when, you're, when you're trying to juggle and talk at the same time. Yeah, like trying to figure out how to get somebody into the Zoom um, and, the, and, the, and the program starts in five minutes. Um, so, so definitely give yourself a little bit of what we call pre-production time, just as you would with any event. We have like, we usually are in the space about an hour before, just the way we would be in a live event. I like our events to be ready and to go and done an hour before they actually start. And so in a digital space, you obviously need less of that, but we're in the Zoom link an hour before the program actually starts to just make sure that we're vetting any potential problems. Yeah, really getting ahead of it. Mm -hmm. um, for both of you, uh, you, you made that move to digital, but you were working with a lot of partners. Like Nadine, you t spoke with a number of different arts groups you were working with. Neil, I know you had not just art artists and performers, you also had artist vendors. Um, how did all of these groups react when you said that you were moving to digital? I know some people would be excited, some would be resistant. Um, did you, wh what were the different kinds of reactions that you got? I'll give that to Neil first. So we were, um, we were nearly fully booked as a festival for performances when we had to cancel, when we had to go online. And uh, yeah, and I would think probably about 80% of the artists that we had on board um, wanted to participate in our digital festival because I think they all realized that this is something you have to learn how to do. Like this is going to be like, the number of musicians we had, we had probably 15 different musicians in in the festival and they um some artists have more uh more capacity to produce a, a higher quality product than others so we had intimate performances done on a webtop lap uh a lab webcam laptop webcam or like full-blown music videos some people made full-blown like outdoor, like they, you could tell they made wow. it that week sort of thing. They went full, they went full out and made music videos. We had like, um, there's a local, uh, they're Chilean musicians called the Andino Sons made um, an amazing concert video, like in a, a venue here called the, the Saskatchewan Cultural Exchange Society on the floor of this beautiful old warehouse venue that was a full 40 minute production and like it, because they have access to the resources, they know a guy or they hired a guy or they felt like, and we did pay part of the production expenses where we could for those kinds of things. So as out, out of, you know, the music budget, it's like, we'll pay half of whatever your production cost was to make this beautiful thing you did. And it's like, yeah. And like I said, it's the new, this may be the new normal for the foreseeable future. So artists, have to get comfortable with this kind of alternate presentation and like the the volume of artists that responded was very encouraging that like yeah they're going to find a way to get out there and do what they're passionate about that's good that's good to hear how about you Nadine um yeah we I mean I think our approach was really um uh, was very open um we were very open to the possibility that uh, particularly around intersections that some of the partners would just not have the capacity um, to do something. So, so we, we were pretty clear that we, there were no expectations um, that people had to. Um, and um, yeah, so the reaction was generally, I mean, some partners said, you know, listen, I just don't have the capacity to do this right now. There's just a lot going on. Um, Particularly, we're working with uh, certain communities who are particularly vulnerable 
uh, made very vulnerable uh, and, and still are at, at, at this time um, by COVID. So, so, you know, you're not really thinking, when you're trying to survive, you're not really thinking about how much to a digital program. You're just trying to think, how am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna make money and, and, and pay for my rent? Um, so, so yeah, it really, uh, um, I'd say quite a few partners were, you know, were able to, to, um, to kind of turn around and, and, and re-envision their projects as a digital program. Um, others felt like it was a really important time. Um, it was an opportunity to, to, to advocate um, for, for community at that time. And so that's what the program looked like. Um, and then again, you know, others just felt like they couldn't do it, so. Yeah, uh, it, it sounds like there was sort of a big variety of responses, even though generally people were positive, both with Neil's program and, and with yours, Nadine. Um, did you find, were you, either of you concerned about how the final product was going to look? I know people have different kinds of capacity in terms of their online abilities or uh, what they feel comfortable with, the amount of resources that they're able to put towards it. Um, were, did you find that any of the programs, are, the, the digital content looked different artist to artist? Um, was there a way that you sort of helped them flow together well so that way it wasn't sort of an abrupt change this might be a little bit more towards you neil just because everything was all sort of streamed in together yeah so um when you ask an artist or an organization to submit a video without any guidelines like we did because we were in a hurry really we were in a mad dash to get, were, yeah. to get this content together so it says so give us a video up to 45 minutes in length is what we said so we found out real quick that uh eight minutes is technically up to 45 minutes. <laughs> that was one it of the problems. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, it's not wrong. So that was the problem we ran into, one of the problems we ran into. But you'll find that you get a, a wide variety of resolutions, formats, file extensions. It's all going to be different. You'll get MP4s, you'll get AVIs, you'll get every every format under the sun. So by editing editing them all together, I could flatten the curve, if you will and get everything to the same acceptable resolution and add my bumpers as needed. So I added little bumpers in between the acts so I could promote various things. I could promote our sponsors. We had um, a local brewery doing beer delivery in the neighborhood. So they were, they were a great partner. They were an excellent partner. Um, and uh, we had an online 50-50 draw as well, which I wanted to promote a lot. And I did want to talk about that a little bit. It varies from province to province, like the legislation on how to, how you can do these kinds of things. But we made triple what we would normally make with a regular 50 50, wow. which would have been, you know, senior citizens walking around with a bucket selling tickets. And we went online and we made $5,500. Like the pot went to $5,500, which is triple what we'd ever done. So because I had these bumpers promoting it, and also Facebook and YouTube at the time, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but they had capped streaming quality to um, preserve bandwidth for essential services and education because they didn't want, you know, everyone jumping onto Amazon Prime and streaming super high def movies all day and all night. So they capped quality to, to keep that at 720. So if someone sends me a 4K video of a performance, that's a little overkill and would probably not work at all. Like it wouldn't, wouldn't even function. It's not, it's Facebook, it's not a Blu-ray. So it's, it's a, a, a necessary step to flatten it to the lowest common denominator basically of, of quality. It will ensure that you don't get lag and you don't get buffering effects that you would normally get live on Facebook especially. Well, it sounds like adding those little clips, like as you said, for the sponsors and the 50-50 was a good way to work around that, but also enhance what was happening at the festival as well. Right. And it, and it corrected my timing. It corrected my timing by just like, so this act is eight minutes and 27 seconds. So I add seven minutes and 33 seconds to round it up to the nearest 15. And then go from there so I could schedule things in even ways right so it starts at this time and it ends at this time because I know 
how long these things are eventually. Like I was scrambling to edit this stuff together in the last week, but that did work the way it was supposed to. <laughs> good. <laughs> Another good idea. I think, I'm sure everyone is frantically writing notes in this webinar. <laughs> Um, I, I was, I'm just about to go to the Q&A and I remembered one last question I wanted to ask both of you. It was a big one and a nice one to cap this off. Um, so the past few months have really forced us to experiment and try new things. Is there anything that you see being something that is going to come to stay? Your organization, excuse me, your organization will continue to have and utilize even once there's a vaccine, once we're out and about and things have returned back to normal. Nadine, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think from my perspective, we are going to continue um, including kind of the digital programs that we've been doing now. Um, we're going to work that into our programming season um, because digital programs, um, while there are some limitations on the technical side, um, uh, you know, certainly it, it opens the door wide in, in many other ways. A digital program is far less expensive. Um, and again, as Neil says, allows us to, I mean, we always try to pay people well, but, but kind of frees our budget a little more in that respect. Um, it, uh, it, it, uh, it provides um, a different kind of accessibility um, on certain fronts. Um, and allows our programming to be accessible in a way that it's not if it's just a live program and it's kind of ephemeral and then disappears. Um, you know, certainly now, um, even after all, all, we do all of our programs live, but we do recorded versions of them. We share them afterwards. Um, you know, we, we share them on our, on our channels and people who, um, like me, I miss everything because usually when other programs that I want to participate in are happening, I'm in our own programs. And so, um, yeah, recorded programs are amazing because I, you know, I'm just so used to missing everything. And, and now, you know, with everybody doing digital programming and recording it, um, there's so much more that you can um, participate in after. Yeah, I know I've definitely taken advantage of some of my CM's recorded programs. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Neil? Sorry? Oh, uh, sorry. Um, is there anything, do you see uh, anything that you tried out this year being something you'll continue for the festival in future years? Yes. Um, our store, our, um, the store we set up for our vendors is so unique and it's... Um, something that we wanted to do for a long time to give our vendors access to online sales. It's a multi-vendor platform, so we actually don't have to do the work ourselves. So they sign up, they add their products, they do all the work. We just administer the transfer of money from customer to artist and no fees in between. Uh, PayPal takes their cut. I think it's four and a quarter percent or something on every transaction we do. But it's, it worked out pretty smoothly and the, the onus for, you know, order fulfillment is on the vendor. It's not on us. So that's like, I, we're not, I'm not Amazon. Like I'm just a guy, right? I'm just one dude. So it's, um, it really worked out that we could have this thing built and we can run it every year and we can sell our own stuff on it if we need to. So that's definitely staying. And I mean, there's a good chance we're going to do that, have to do this again next year like in May, like yes. we're, we're not going to be able to have a street fair. That's for sure. There's, we're not going to be able to get 15,000 people packed into the street for, for the, our street fair. I, I very much doubt that's going to happen. So we'll be doing some modified programming this year, I'm sure. But like what we learned from streaming and our, our new website will be with us forever. So it's a forever investment when you buy in, when you get a new website, it's time, you know, it's, it's there forever. Yeah, absolutely. That infrastructure is something that you can continue to take advantage of afterwards. All right. I am moving over to the Q and a, we've had some good ones coming in. Um, so the first question, is, Joan and her team in Newfoundland are currently working on developing a digital project that would showcase a behind the scenes look at the process of creating an exhibition from start to finish. 
Uh, they want to have an idea of what their best options are. Uh, should they create a special website or do they need to hire a professional designer or videographer? Uh, or is there something else that they might be able to do to create an engaging exhibition? Nadine, that one might be good for you. I know you've done some online exhibition stuff. Sure. I mean, I think it, I think it really depends on, again, like what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, if you're hoping to, um, you know, certainly if it's just something that you're going to put up um, and uh, uh, like a record, there's something about a recorded version of a program that requires a level of production um, that a live program does not. Live program is always going to be more forgiving, um, whereas, if, and, and also the duration of the program, it affects the duration of the program. If something's recorded, uh, particularly like a behind the scenes of like putting up an, an exhibit, particularly something like that, um, I, uh, and it's not live, I would definitely suggest, um, and you know, it's going to be like 10, 10 minutes, more than 10 minutes. I would highly suggest that like you want to hire a professional videographer you want to make that look good you want the production values to be high um, but the real benefit of a live program is that people get to engage in that um, and to have and and to do a very kind of you know things can look much more raw have lower production values if you're walking through and um, or not necessarily walking through because how does that work but 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 you know to have um, the audience be able to engage with the curator, with the artist, with whoever, and then you can do kind of maybe smaller um, clips of a walkthrough or of, of, of kind of the visual elements of it that might that may be a little bit higher in production value that you might have pre-recorded. Um, just be sure that you really practice your your your, <laughs> your media sharing. Um, but yeah, I, I, to me, there's something about, um, there's something special about this time where people can uh, engage in a very, um, in a way that doesn't feel like they're in a room with a hundred people asking a question. Um, yeah, I, I, I would take advantage of, of, of that. Yeah, it feels a lot more intimate. You're able to engage more with a curator or something. Neil, do you have anything to add? Um... I'm just going to share in the chat real quick um, a video editing software I use because it's like a lot of us have Adobe accounts and Adobe subscriptions and um, something like Adobe Premiere Pro is an absolutely baffling ordeal sometimes. Like it is so over the top. Like you're not Martin Scorsese, right? Like none of us are. So um, what I shared in the chat there, Wondershare Fomora, it's a hundred dollars for a lifetime license. It's very much drag and drop. And I have no formal education in video editing. I have a little bit, but like no real education in film making. And I managed with it. It's good to know. I know I personally am always intimidated by those, those oh, different types of software. Nightmare. So. It's a uh, yes. Premiere Pro is a nightmare. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, next question was talking about attendance. Did you notice a difference between the digital attendance versus the in-person attendance at your past events? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it depended. Um, sorry, well, there was one thing that I just wanted to say. Oh, sure, yeah. From the last question. I want to say if, it, if your program's longer than two minutes. Uh, and it's not live because honestly, our attention spans have gotten even shorter with COVID. Nobody's going to sit and watch like a five. I'm not going to sit and watch a five minute video unless it's super compelling. Anyway, so just back to attendance. Um, yeah, I would say certainly at the beginning, people were really hungry for content. Um, and so the kinds of programs we have events called Connects. Um, which are, can look like many different things, but are about bringing different people together, different ideas together. Those events tend to be, just because of space and what we can afford and the budget for that program, tend to be about 100 people um, live. Um, and so certainly at the beginning, you know, we were seeing, I don't know, registrations of up to like 500 people and, and maybe over 200 people showing up. We've still had um, for programs that would normally, again, because of the container where it was going to be held, um, 
we've had, you know, up to 400 people show up um, for a program that normally would have only had the capacity for 100 people um, if we had held it during intersections. So, so yeah, there's certainly the capacity for larger audiences at this time. But then again, you know, as more and more people are doing digital programs, you have, you know, you're, you're also competing with a lot more. So, so um, I would certainly uh, encourage everyone to, to, to be really thinking about, you know, um, what your expectations are in terms of audience, um, what's realistic, what's out there, um, and, and not be, um, and not have expectations that because it's on the internet, like 10,000 people are going to show up. Did you find, I mean, my ZM, all of your events take place in Toronto. It's a very Toronto centric space. Uh, did you find that a lot of your digital programs were getting audiences from outside of Toronto because they were online? Yeah, we definitely, um, there's definitely like a small portion of audience members that are from the US, that are from Europe, that are from Asia, you know, um, just today in our program, uh, somebody in the chat said hi from the UK. So, so we are having audiences that we, we um, might not normally see in our programming, um, but, but certainly the scope of, of what we uh, talked about in, in, in programs have kind of extended beyond just a Toronto specific narrative. Um, so that's helped as well. Great. How about you, Neil? Yeah, our attendance, um, if you can, I mean, if you can call it attendance, if it, cause like we did, I did a four hour plus stream, which was sort of come and go. Right. And like, I'm sitting there and I'm watching the number in the corner of the screen go up and down and it hovered around our normal sort of attendance like a literary event would normally comprise of a poetry slam but this year a lot of our literary events were just readings so it would be someone sitting in a chair and reading a book for an hour so and i mean we have engagement in those communities for sure like that's it was remarkable actually we did have a lot of international for our literary events was our most international except for the andino sons i guess we had a lot of uh, chileans like it was very like the chat was almost exclusively Spanish for 45 minutes. It was great. That's cool. And, um, but yeah, our attendance, like I have, I have the, the, the actual figures here. If anyone's interested, it's, uh, 22 hours of video. Um, it was 19 separate broken out into 19 separate videos. And that's mostly because of the screw up on Friday that, uh, with the licensed music, but we had 56,000 views across that. So, and, but when, and I, I hate to be a downer about it, but when you see a video view and you go, oh, that's great. A video view is three seconds. That's it. That is, that's what they, that's, that counts as a view. So they went, they watched it and they go, eh, no. And then they, they walked away. That counts as a view. I'll take it. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to jinx it by talking about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to jinx it by talking about it too much. Even though <laughs> so, Neil, I would, <laughs> I would say, um, and if anybody from Facebook is watching, um, <laughs> I would say, so personally, like when I'm reporting our numbers, we don't include the Facebook views um, after the, the live event. We do stream from Zoom to Facebook, and we don't include the Facebook views just because we can't determine, like a view is three seconds, but a view could also be longer. Right. It, the, the problem with Facebook is they don't provide the analytics that let you know, like Zoom will let you know how many people came and how long mm -hmm. they engaged with your program. So mm -hmm. we also don't include anything less than, I believe, 10 minutes. So if somebody came to our Zoom program, but then disengaged after 10 minutes, I don't count that as, as engagement. Uh, I don't count that in my engagement numbers. but. Um, but certainly the thing is, it's, it's hard because you can't discount those views. Um, we just don't know what they mean. Like yeah. those, those, those views, those 5,000 views could mean that they engaged with the whole thing. Um, and I wish that Facebook would provide those analytics because it would really give us all a better, I mean, especially in this time, it would give us all a better sense of, of um, you know, what, what those numbers mean. But certainly I'll take it too. I'll yeah, take exactly. 
and that's just it, right? Like that's an industry. It's it's a it's a conversation that that it, it's an industry wide conversation that we need to not have. I would say, in that the people that we're reporting these figures to for for grant reports and for sponsorship reports, like if I go to a, the we have a tele our local telecom SaskTel is a big sponsor. If I go to them and say, well, we got 56,000 views, but it's actually probably more like 1800. They're not going to, they're not, they don't want to hear that because they're using those same metrics to report to their higher ups and they're using those metrics. So the whole game has been rigged on this, yeah. on this three second view thing. Neil, this, this points to a larger problem around numbers and the way that we're asked to report numbers. <laughs> but I hate it. I hate it. It was yeah. so hard. <laughs> when somebody asked, because it was, that was just it. It's like people reporting for their grants to their local arts boards are saying, oh, well, you know, how did ad adapting to online affect your engagement? But like, they don't actually want to know, you know? Yeah. It, it, yeah, and I think, you know, we've, we've certainly had this debate within our own organization about how we talk about these numbers, how we look at these numbers, and, and I would absolutely say that, you know, my thing is we can't discount those views because we, as I said, we don't know what they are, but also those views are a form of engagement that's still um, important and valid because it, in this time, um, as we know, like sometimes you need um, it's, it's also visibility, you know, regardless of if that view is, 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 you know, 20 seconds or 20 minutes, it's provided you, your festival, your organization with visibility online. And that's also very valuable. So it's, it's, it's trying to find the balance of like, yeah. And it's valuable to sponsors, you know, uh, that's val. That's, that's what the sponsors want to see is people engaged with this product. X number of times, which means X number of engagements for us. So we're getting our money's worth. Yes. Use those numbers, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's we a good just way. changed the whole system. <laughs> that's a good tip to end this on. <laughs> All right. Well, yes, we're just past 3.30. So thank you very much for everyone to sticking out with us. Um, and thank you to Nadine and Neil. We really appreciated you spending your time and, and sharing your expertise with us. I know I have a lot of things that I'm going to be thinking about as I'm heading into the Culture Days Festival. I have no doubt that everyone else will too. Um, and Alyssa just shared a whole bunch of links for people, uh, which are very useful. There are a couple of things about programs, uh, different websites, stuff like that, both for Myzeum and for the Cathedral Village Arts Festival. Uh, definitely please check those out and continue learning even after this webinar is done. Uh, today's recording will be available on the Culture Days website shortly. We'll let you all know when that is. You should be getting an email from Zoom later. Uh, don't forget the best way to stay in the loop with Culture Days is by checking out our newsletter. You can sign up at culturedays.ca slash newsletter. And before I go, I just want to take a moment to mention that Culture Days registration is open. As you can expect, things are a little bit different this year. The celebration kicks off on September 25th and runs for four whole weeks. It's not just a weekend anymore. So it's going for September 25th to October 25th. Similarly to what we discussed here today, you can register online presentations, either live streams or pre-recorded content. Uh, we are also having things like self-guided programming or things that like socially distanced programs. For the in-person events, we do encourage you to be thinking about what those restrictions are in your own area. It's a national festival and everything's quite different province to province. The registration is really fast and simple, but if you have any questions about it, our staff are definitely here and happy to help. Uh, we're at culture day, or sorry, info at culturedays.ca. So thank you once more. Thank you to all of our panelists and I really appreciate everybody tuning in today. So have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.